Stay tuned. So I think this talk fits in. I think the idea here with this talk is really to, these are my disclosures, is really to kind of show you how EVIS or extravascular ultrasound can help you. We all know and are starting to realize more and more that intravascular ultrasound is important. It makes a difference. And I think I'll show you in a couple of examples where I think EVIS does the same thing, you know, if you don't have it in your lab. So we know that CTOs are a problem, right? And part of the issue is that, you know, it's, it's, like I showed earlier in, in the morning, you know, I showed complex crossing techniques. Prolonged procedure time, increased radiation, higher chance for dissection, AV fistula formation and perforation. And obviously in some people's hands there's a higher likelihood for stent placement. And I think if you look at the data across the board, there's still a 20 to 50% crossing failure rate, believe it or not, in, in depending on the experience of the operator. And we all know that means an unsuccessful revascularization, which can be a problem. But if you're going to start doing EVIS or extravascular ultrasound, there's a couple of important ultrasound findings that I think that will really help you. And I think Fadi Saab alluded to this this morning, is that if you look at the lower image on the left, that's a tibial vessel. You can see dense calcification, both intimal and medial, and you can see that there are these gaps in the calcification. That's basically areas that are known as Genali gaps. Those are basically areas of negative remodeling. There's really no arterial lumen or arterial wall there, and that really makes any revascularization that you try to do with any techniques very difficult and sometimes impossible. This, uh, the two images, uh, the one in the middle and the one on the right, is also showing you the same thing again, but in a different view. It's showing you what's called a white stop sign. If you like names, that's what it, people refer to it as. It's basically dense calcification. It's like a boulder or a rock filling the entire lumen. And again, when you're dealing with tibial vessels and so forth, getting through these, around these, is basically impossible. And a lot of patients, when you see this in the plantar circulation, uh, in the pedal uh, circulation, those are the patients that ultimately either end up with an amputation if you don't end up doing a deep venous arterialization, but that's another talk. So we're all familiar with extravascular ultrasound in terms of access, avoiding plaque, avoiding calcification, and so forth. But I want to show you what you can do when you're doing CTO recanalizations. Look at how well you can see uh, a guide wire within a, an occluded vessel that's being recanalized in intraluminal fashion. So imagine trying to do this for fluoroscopy like we all do and we, and we still will going forward, but maybe this is an adjunct. This is something to help you in cases where you're having difficulty getting through and through access. I think here's the classic way we'll do it. You know, here's a classic subintimal recanalization. You can see the catheter and the guide wire spiraling around the artery to get through there. And now we have to start thinking about, do I need retrograde access? Do I need dual access? Do I need to use a reentry device, et cetera? Look at this recanalization using extravascular ultrasound. Again, I have a tech, not an ultrasound tech, actually my, my tech that help, helps me during cases that I've actually trained to do this so that while I'm doing a recanalization, I can see if I'm intraluminal or subintimal or am I perforating through uh, a CTO. And then obviously I was intraluminal, so I was able to deliver therapy in this case without having to stent an SFA or a popliteal artery, which we all hate to do if, and, and like to avoid. Here's another CLI patient. Again, ambiguous proximal cap with an occluded tibular. It's a CLI patient. He's got ischemia and, and tissue loss in the uh, distribution of the anterior tibial artery. And you can see this is a tough recanalization if you do it from above because you're not really sure where that cap is. So what did I do? I did retrograde access because we had a hibernating dorsalis pedis artery, which I was able to access, again, with ultrasound in this case. And you can see I'm doing my recanalization under ultrasound guidance in this case and able to stay relatively intraluminal and then basically able to get, you know, externalize my wire, reverse my access, and ultimately deliver therapy. This patient had a lot of hibernating vessels in the foot and luckily had an intact pedal plantar loop, so we were good there. What about this? I want you to look at this relatively, it's, it's a near flush occlusion, right? I think we have an idea of where to probe, where to start, but look at how well you can see that proximal cap and the morphology of it using, again, extravascular ultrasound. So now there's no guessing where that profunda origin is. There's no guessing in terms of am I subintimal when I start my recanalization because obviously what you don't want to do is compromise that, that deep femoral artery when you're delivering therapy 
uh, uh, during, the, during the case. And you can see here we were able to, to stent that uh, proximal segment and, and, and really deliver therapy in good fashion. This actually fits into what Rob was saying. You know, intravascular ultrasound or IVUS makes a big difference. Here's a patient who's a CLI patient who had tibial disease because you're not going to have tissue loss with this lesion in the PT segment, let's face it. But patient had, had two-vessel tibial disease, which was treated, had this as well in the P2 segment. It was heavily calcified which we knew from fluoroscopy and ultrasound in the office, uh, treated it with basically angioplasty, shock wave, et cetera. How many people would look at this and say it's a good treatment? Just raise your hand. Would you leave this? Would you stent it? I think looking at this, it meets all the criteria of doing nothing, right? There's no flow limitation. You don't see an obvious flap. Maybe you see a little filling defect there, but maybe that's calcium. What if I showed you this? This is what it looks like under extravascular ultrasound. And this is basically, if you did IVUS, you would see the same thing. So now you have a high-grade stenosis. It's at least 80, 90% when we measured with ultrasound. You can see there's a dissection, there's recoil, and then there's a, a, there's a lot of calci calcification and plaque. So what did we do? We went ahead and put in an intervo interwoven night null stent. We were able to treat this patient well. And you can see, from a flow standpoint, it looks about the same, but look at the difference on extravascular ultrasound during the case on the procedure to tell us that we have a good outcome in this case. Again, IVIS could work in this case as well. So here's another case to show you that extravascular ultrasound can also help you with what Bob just showed us, which is stent, stent malposition, or maybe you don't have good dilation, you don't have proper sizing. You can see, look at the wall apposition when I'm looking at the stent uh, with extravascular ultrasound. Again, telling me that I have a good uh, lumen, I have good gain here uh, with extravascular ultrasound. Again, another patient with a flush occlusion in the SFA reconstitutes the distal SFA. Again, here, you know, we have access from above, we have access from below. We're clearly in two different subintimal planes or tracks, and we're trying to get these two to meet. I can use different wires, use heavier tip loads, shape them, try to do this, but you know what we did? We used ultrasound, and we were able to see where these two systems were, and as a result, we were able to get through and through access pretty easily using ultrasound guidance in this case, and then basically able to deliver therapy. Finally, here's a case I showed this morning for a different reason, but I'm going to show you the same case. Again, again CLI patient, right, advanced limb salvage, really had nothing below the popliteal artery, had really terrible runoff, and really this was the only named vessel you could see in the, in the leg, which is really the reconstitution of the distal posterior tibial artery. So again, luckily had a hibernating uh, dorsalis pedis artery or anterior tibial artery. We accessed that, used ultrasound to confirm that we were intraluminal. We were able to show this with extravascular ultrasound that our recanalization was, uh, was intraluminal and not subintimal. Again, you could use IVIS to do this as well. So this is not to say that this uh, replaces intravascular ultrasound, but it gives you a good idea. And I did do IVIS to confirm that we're intraluminal, just to prove it to myself, because I wanted to see if, if what I'm seeing is, is true. And then we, were, we obviously performed good vessel prep and, and therapy, and, and this patient had a lot of hibernating vessels below the ankle. So you can see we have a nice CLI endpoint, right, an angiographic wound blush, one of the things we always look for when we're on the table, because uh, that really is a positive predictor of wound healing in the future. And with good wound care and HBOT and so forth, over about eight months, we were able to get significant wound healing. So in conclusion, I think extravascular ultrasound is important. I think it's a helpful tool when you're performing revascularizations. It's not a replacement for what we do with fluoroscopy, and I think it adds to intravascular ultrasound use as well. Thanks, Bob.